Welcome to Slayer Fest 98. I'm Angela Rockstar. I'm Ian Martin. I'm Philip Ellis. And I'm Ian Carlos Crawford. And today we're here to talk Angel Season 2's The Thin Dead Line. But before we get into the episode, I wanted to give a little plug to our Patreon, which has been newly revamped. You can now get access to audio episodes, video episodes, and more. We've been doing a lot more video content over there. The tiers start at $2 or $1 and go up to $30. With $30, you can become a full interactive with the podcast and you can like give your little outros. Um, and at the $1 tier, you can get into our Facebook group and our Discord. Any and all support is much appreciated. But now let's get into the episode. What did we think? What do we think overall of this episode, uh, Philip? So I actually, uh, I know we've, we've, I think maybe I've said this before about season two of Angel. A lot of it really does like blur together for me. Yeah. Um, the Dala arc, you know, it's really serialized. Um, a lot of it, you know, you, I kind of, I, I can't remember like what happens week to week, but this one did really stand out in my memory yeah. um, because I mean, I really love the character of Anne and I just like the sort of the fact that it takes place over one night and it is kind of like a mini horror movie. So yeah. I was keen to revisit it. And I mean, <laughs> there's always some issues with tone when they do their like ghetto episodes and they yeah. you know, they go back into like Gunn's backstory and his milieu. But for the most part, I liked it. Like, there were some really good character moments in there. And I, I love this little run of episodes before we get to epiphany where yeah. wesley cordy and gun are doing their own thing and they're becoming their own unit i love the dynamic between the three of them and how close they get so yeah um it was uh, it was an interesting one to revisit all right angela i really meant to look up exactly what the date was that this episode dropped because it was so i guess uh charged with <laughs> yeah yeah with uh with 2001 in, is when it dropped 2001 so i think that that was a, a bold move a lot of those conversations yeah. they were having they that really hadn't hit the the mainstream actually so that that actually makes me value this episode a little bit more it would have been kind of tacky if it was done what 10 years later or nine or five or whenever yeah. I think that it was it, it's actually kind of poignant the way that they did things and wh- how they talked about things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ian? <laughs> no, I, I think that I have a tendency to watch this through too much of a modern lens. I love that take of contextualizing something in the time that it, it occurred in. Progressive eventually looks regressive, um, yeah. you know. Yeah. Lucy uh, and uh, Ricky sleep in separate beds. Uh, but, you know, the Lucille Ball show was uh, a super progressive show for the time. Right. But I think that this uh, episode is a weird mishmash. <laughs> uh, there, there are a lot of interesting things here, but um, they ultimately end up kind of undercut by itself uh which we can get into uh later and uh, generally i'm in to the buffy verse for the team mm-hmm. when the scoobies are all hanging out together and the banter is flying it's a ton of fun when they are all angry at each other and off on their own or fighting uh it's less fun to me and this run where angel is off doing his uh, gray angel things to me is ultimately just a lot less satisfying than the seasons where, you know, the, the core hangs together. Okay. You know, I am like a mix of all of your opinions because mm-hmm. I actually like Ian and I were texting about this episode uh, cause you were afraid it would be like a pile on. And I was like, I actually kind of like this episode, but mostly because I mean, one, you're right, Angela. It's like, for back in the day, this would be a little bit progressive, but, like, now it is not. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> but, uh, you know, and I can, like, appreciate it for being what it was back then. Um, Philip, I for sure agree with you. Anytime they go to Guns, like, old gang, it's never done that well. Yeah, They, like, fumble that so hard every single time. Mm. Um, and the fact that we know, like, one of the last appearances of appearances of them is in season three when the gang like tries to what is it blow up caritas um but i just am a sucker for like 
The thing I do like is what actually what you said, Ian, is that you, I know you don't like when the team is split up. I like that at the end, they all are working together. It reminds me of like the Buffy episode, Dead Man's Party, where like, I just like seeing like, you don't see it in the Buffy verse that often because they don't have the budget where there's like a ton of monsters attacking one spot and everyone is like fighting to like having to fight them. I just like when that happens. So like, this episode works for me because I'm a sucker for a zombie plot. I wish, I kind of wish they had done more with the zombie stuff, the like whole zombie of it all. Like, well, let me see some arms ripping off. Let me see, you know, more of that. But, you know, it's also television, so they sterilize it. So there's like no blood. I, I, I think I'm, I think I agree with you. I'm not a sucker for a zombie plot, but I'm a sucker for a cousin of the zombie plot, which is the invasion of the body snatchers plot. Yeah. This is probably one of the best zombie episodes in the Buffyverse, I think. The ending actually feels genuinely harrowing, and the the cops tearing down the windows and all of that is very evocative of Night of the Living Dead, which yeah. interestingly had some pretty significant racial commentary included in it, which this is... I don't know if it's attempting to tackle, but by nature of the content, it's yeah. there. You know, Ian, that's a that's a really good point that I meant to bring up. I couldn't tell if they were trying to or just like, like you said, it becomes that because of doing this story. There's no way it wouldn't be, right? Yeah, they chicken out yes. uh, with a couple of specific beats that we'll, we can get into uh, later on that I find deeply frustrating. And I think that sort of the idea of crime and police and all of that has evolved now where there's another factor that accidentally is in the episode that uh, the episode kind of ignores that is more significant than good guys versus bad guys versus police versus any of the stuff that the episode talks about. So it's, it's, it's almost a frustrating episode because it's attempting a bunch of interesting things and maybe it would have done better if it just, as you said, focused on the zombiness of it all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, I actually am like, I was wondering if everyone would like really hate this episode and I'm glad you don't. Um, because also I will say like, this is, you know, the Philip, you like this error. I, it's weird. I think this is a good idea. I like the angel. And again, I hate even referencing this, but I can't think of another like specific pop culture reference. He's like going through his like Harry Potter five where it's like, he's just being shitty to everyone around him. I like the idea of that. I like that the Cordy, Gunn, and Wesley get closer and start their own, like, investigation group. But it doesn't, like, I think these episodes are very, like, muddled. It, like, feels like we're, like, we're almost, like, wasting time until uh, Reprise and Epiphany, um, which are fantastic. Yeah, it's, we, we have, like, this sort of little run of, um, it's, like, we're, de- we're doing this, ser- like, the character stuff is all very serialized, where Angel is on doing his, he's on his loner bullshit you know like yeah. when we first see him in this episode he's in the hotel all by himself and like just having a you know having a real like depression wallow yeah and and the stuff with cordelia and the others is serialized and that they're off doing their own thing but the episodes it's like a it's like a little run of self-contained plotty like mystery of the week episodes taking place where like but like everyone's apart Mm. And then, like, it's it, it, yeah, it's like I, I think I admire what they're trying to do with it, where they're where they're doing yes. the, you know, the Buffy thing, which is a serialized plot with um with like a monster of the week, but they're doing it in a it's sort of a almost like a season six of Buffy way, where everyone is just kind of like a little bit miserable and a little bit adrift, yeah, um, yeah, and then it's like the plot of the week that kind of keeps bringing them together, uh, and I really the the button on the end of this episode where um, Cordelia tells Angel to stay away and actually, you know what, like, we've got this. Yeah. I really like that. The the aimlessness of it is such a weird note after redefinition where everyone's hinting at epic things. Angel is montaging for the episode. I'm, re- I'm not ready yet. I've got to get ready. I've got to sharpen my skills. Now I'm ready. Uh, ready to do what exactly? Uh, we don't know. They don't specifically tell. Uh, get into it. Um, Darla and Drew are talking about taking over in Wolfram and Hart, and they're going to control uh, uh, Lila and Lindsay. That just kind of falls off the board. Redefinition hints that, that you know, and then everyone loves the bit where 
uh, Dark Angel sets Darla and Drew on fire. It's beautifully shot and all of that. Yeah. But then these episodes do not feel like yes. any of that pays off. These are individually in a bubble interesting episodes. But from the perspective of the arc, the arc feels on pause for three episodes. Um and I've learned that I actually just hate redefinition. I actually enjoy Blood Money, this episode, oh, and, and Happy Anniversary, which is one of the worst episodes in the series. <laughs> but, but Blood Money and um, this episode in particular, I think are fine. They're entertaining, um, fun little one-offs. It's just the arc feels so aimless. Like, yeah. they don't know where this is going. The only episodes in this this season that feel like they have a thesis are Tim Mineers. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I wanted to mention, just apropos of nothing, is the writing pedigree on this one is very strange. Um, it was written by Jim Koof and Sean Ryan. Sean Ryan later went on to create The Shield, oh, a, cool. a, a story about corrupt, dark police. And Jim Koof uh, was, wrote the screenplay for Rush Hour and the two National Treasure movies. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So, All right. <laughs> uh, very unusual uh, pedigree on this one. Clearly, they had a fascination with police and cliche. I want to say that sounds mean. <laughs> mm, yeah, I, I, you, you're absolutely right in that this episode and, and the episodes that preceded it do sort of smack of judy benz was busy we yeah. need to like tread water for a couple of weeks yeah i i think that is the reality of what happened i think um that Lindsay was the actor who played Lindsay needed to move on i think yeah julie benz got busy i that i believe that's what i've heard whatever the original plans were that redefinition hints at which is this big epic montage heavy i'm not even sure if it's sarcastic montage or if they were trying to be serious and it just was cheese <laughs> but then you get these three and it's like where are we going with this guys yeah angela what were you gonna say oh i was just gonna say i thought that even the when when i originally watched this i guess back in 2001 i don't think that i would have even understood you know it says uh thin the episode's called thin deadline and it's because it's of the thin blue line and there were a lot of things that i think i just wasn't cognizant of yeah yeah um back then that i really caught on to now especially in the present you know climate and with everything that we've had all the all the marches the protests everything against police brutality that's come up over the past five years or so you know it's it's very interesting i think if this episode was done in a modern time, it it would have felt very cliche, but now I'm thinking about where I was in 2001 and these weren't really, I mean, necessarily subjects that were being broached on a fantasy sitcom necessarily. So I kind of, I don't know when I was watching it again, I was just like, wow, this is somehow still poignant. Even though I didn't even, you know, I I may have been privileged enough not to recognize how poignant it was back then. Or maybe I did know those things. I guess I can't really say what I was thinking in high school and college. But it it just seemed very interesting, this episode. Like, it fits in today. I don't know. The archy part of the metaphor, too, that I really actually like is police are the ostensible good guys who are going too far and pushing into evil. Yes. As in Angel locking a bunch of lawyers in uh, the wine cellar who are all evil people, but we know that's wrong. And there is such a thing as too far for the good guys. I love that parallel. I think that's an ingenious way of connecting this one-off story to the arc and the examination of what Angel did. But um, other than that, I think there are problems. I think also... um I mean, I, I, I do, uh, I, I feel very bad for um, Elizabeth Rom because I feel like every Kate episode that we've covered, we've just torn that character <laughs> to shreds. Um, this is approaching one of Kate's better episodes. I mean, not her hair. Her hair looks dreadful. I don't know what yeah. she was doing. Um, but the, it, there's, a, the, there's a logical reason for her character to be in here. And it's like, we're approaching the moment that she gets to in Reprise and Epiphany. Yes. Um, but like, you actually like, you uh, you completely empathize with her and kind of understand her point of view in this and yeah. even like her bringing up her dead dad trauma again 
which you know I, I do all the time um <laughs> it's like it's there's a there's a reason within the plot for it to happen she's not just like right. bringing up her dad dad because she wants to have a go at angel and and be all you know whiny right. um and so it's like having you know the show introduced her as a, a a point of view within law enforcement and then never really figured out a, a way to use that character within the wider plot. And this is, I think, maybe the, one of the first times where they do. And it's Kate reckoning with the fact that she knows that there is evil in the world and actually, like is working within the police the best way that she can affect change in the world. You know, she says towards the end of the episode, this job is making me crazy. Yeah. Um, and I just, I like that, you know, we finally get a kind of really believable human moment from her. Yes. I think, I think I might've said this before because my only, the only positive thing I can say about Kate is she gets good before she leaves. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I feel like they started putting a little bit more effort because like you said, Philip, there is a reason for her to be, invested in this there is a reason for her to be like fuck are they going to do this to my dad and Mm. like you know that all makes sense and tracks she's not just being a dickhead to angel and blaming him for her father's death like she has in you know 85 other episodes but yeah i so i guess we'll we'll let's start so we the episode begins it's kind of setting where everyone is angels mopey walking around the empty hotel and ian it's funny that you brought this up because I was thinking, like, it's weird that we're, like, seeing this as if he's like, oh, man, I had to push them away because, because why? We don't, there's no, like, it feels like we're building to something that he knows is coming because that's why he pushed them away. And then there's, there's not. So why is he sad? He did it on purpose. Yeah, both Angel and Wolfram and Hart are a little too mystery boxy uh, this season. You know, Wolfram and Hart just say it's, it's part of the plan. Oh, uh, they don't. They never say what the plan is, yeah. but they say, "Oh, it's it's part of the plan." Oh, she's turned too early. Oh, it's happening too fast. You know, like they're all in control. But um, what's his name's eyes? The leader of Wolfram and Hart, uh, Holland Manners. Holland, yes. Holland's eyes when Angel goes dark and he's getting bitten into say. This isn't part of the plan, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, and yet it then becomes again. Oh, well, Angel's part of the apocalypse, but, it, it, but it's clear that they don't really have a plan. There's no idea what the plan is. And Angel monologuing and redefinition again is like, I've got to be ready. I'm going to war. What war? What? What war? What are you talking about? And then it never it just never crystallizes. It's it's hollow drama um for the sake of just driving the plot which i suppose i prefer a mystery box more to a conflict vending machine those episodes of buffy where joyce just is a jerk for no reason and being (laughs) totally unreasonable you know i'd rather that first time conflict or uh mystery boxes work great the first time you watch the show yeah the more you watch them the more mystery boxes become hollow and empty uh but conflict vending machines are always annoying i think if i was to give this run of episodes kind of a generous reading um it would be maybe the lesson is like there is never a good reason to push away the people who want to help you yeah and angel is like slowly learning that lesson (laughs) Yeah, the mirror bits and you're reflected in the people around you are the lovely parts of this, the parts that work really well. It's, you know, it, it again, the whole season's a hodgepodge of of good, great and bad. Yeah, that's, I, I'm realizing going through the season that I have definitely mixed up seasons two and three. Like I thought Reprise and Epiphany were in three. And speaking of Reprise and Epiphany, I, they do something here that I like, which I mean, I, Ian, you've mentioned this too. Reprise and Epiphany are like, to, it's like a fantastic arc that does feel like a season finale. But I like that we get... This is something that Angel and Buffy didn't always do, but when they did, they did it well. Like, we get this, like, little girl who has a third eye, and it's, like, brushed off as a joke later, but this becomes an important plot in, like, two episodes? One episode, right? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. really unusual. The, the case opens in this one and then carries into the becomes an important detail in the next two episodes um and they didn't do that very often but um it's here and i like that again we get a sort of um like there's a duality in the episode that you know the the case of the week you know business is slow wesley cordy and gunner in the office and their case of the week or what we think is going to be the case of the week is 
the Sharp family, who are friends of Virginia, they're wealthy, they go to a country club, um, you know, they, they're paying clients um, who just happen to have, you know, sort of fallen prey to something on the streets. Uh, and then the actual story of the episode is about all of these like homeless teens and, you know, uh, people of color and, and the people who are really vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones that actually end up really needing their help. Yes, yes. I love that they, I love a story that is serialized but not like we still get a monster of the week and like we'll put a pin in that girl with the eye on her head we'll go back to that later like and, i like and that. because it's my jam i'm fascinated thinking about what the eye in the back of the head would have been a metaphor for in its episode had that been the episode what was that what were they what was that the what was the allegory you know um but it's funny it's funny to think of metaphors left on the floor uh because they went and did something else i just wonder if you could get like eyelash extensions on that eyeball like, that's what i was wondering i'm like hmm, i wonder if i would remove it or like try and hook it up like, <laughs> Angela, you're like posting selfies on the back of your head. You're like, look how cute exactly. my eye looks today. Look at my eye today, y'all. <laughs> I mean, like Anne says, it's very handy. That's right. <laughs> um, and so then we cut to Anne's shelter. And I it's Anne is such a weird character, and I love like this is shit I love about the Buffy verse, right? This character and every appearance, it could be her first appearance, right? Like it doesn't really matter that she's carried over from the other show. Doesn't really matter that she has met Buffy twice. And we get to see that, like, as Anne, she is helping people. And I don't know, I just really like that. I I like that she's a through line through the shows and she's in the finale of Angel. Like, it's so weird and nice, though, right? Because it's like, we see this is a character that was mostly helped by Buffy, but has been helped by, like, everyone on the shows. And it's really good to see a character who doesn't have superpowers, but, like, knows how dangerous this world is. Um, just, and, and um, you know, the episode that uh, just went out about Blood Money, which, you know, was her sort of first episode of Angel. Um, it's really good to see a character who, like, knows all this shit and is just, like, doing the unglamorous work of trying to make the world a slightly safer place for the people yes. who need it. And the fact that we know her backstory, we know that she was homeless, we know that she's, you know, been, you know, sort of uh, manipulated and, and yeah. gaslit and, and brainwashed and, and, and has gone through literal hell makes it kind of more rewarding to know that she comes at the other end like a better person and now she's like a mentor and a yes. protector. But in a very like everyday, mundane, yeah, hard she's not work doing kind of way. hero shit, fighting or whatever. Yeah, she's folding blankets. You know right. what? She used that blood money. She bought a load of sleeping bags. Yeah, yeah. I also love too that um, Buffy the show is loaded with characters that are in some way representative of something Buffy was dealing with at that time in the, her arc, mm-hmm. whatever the theme of the season is, or or whatever the lesson is she needs to learn, and. Chanterelle, Anne, uh, Millie, you know, whatever her names were on that show, uh, was one of them. You know, Anne yeah. is the very significant example. She did go to um, hell with Buffy uh, when her boyfriend dies. She says, "Who's going to take care of me now?" Which is supposed to relate to uh, Angel's turn and Buffy having to kill him. And then they go to hell together. And at the end of the episode. Um, and takes Buffy's identity. She finds herself, and uh, and Buffy returns home uh, in the same way. And so that idea of her sort of taking on adulthood in the same way Buffy did carries so beautifully into the show. She feels like it feels like we relate to her a little bit in a way that we could relate to Buffy because she was on similar journeys as Buffy was. So she has that same sort of dignity or gravitas i mean um she has arced by way of proximity to buffy um, yeah which is yeah. pretty cool for a side character yes and like not even just i m- most shows wouldn't have a character like this right like yeah um so i just and i like that she's competent and confident and like like you said philip she's not doing the like fun glamorous like cool hero shit 
But also she's just like a normal person is what I like too, right? Mm -hmm. She's like doing what she can to help. She doesn't have, you know, this weirdly sometimes rich vampire to bank her or like a watcher (laughs) to give her a check. Like she is just herself trying to do her best and helping in any way she can. Um, And that's just fucking nice. I don't know. It's nice. Um, Also, I need to point out, it is weird that Miss Jackson is playing in the background. That feels like, a bigger music budget than they normally had on the show. I I have that in my notes that it's like a really nice early two thousands needle drop. But yeah, yeah, it ain't like Buffy always had like interesting pop music cues, but Angel kind of doesn't. When I think of Angel, I just think of like um, the score. There's very few actual, and, and you know, and then there's like obviously when they do karaoke. Um, but there's never, or, or there's, yeah, there's very rarely like actual like pop music references in Angel. Yes. I think just because um, Angel as a show is not as concerned with pop culture as, you know, uh, a high school show where right. pop culture is the language that Buffy and her friends use. Yeah. To, uh, to reference the show I reference all the time, that's not Buffy. Um, Philip and Angela, I don't know if you two remember in the first season of The Magicians when we go into Quentin's mind and they sing. Literally, like five yeah. seconds Taylor of Taylor Swift. Swift. Yep. Yes. <laughs> and it's the, so the worst good. Taylor Swift song as well. <laughs> it's such a Shake good it I love it. Shake it off. Uh, uh. I will say, I like that song, Philip. I love her like <laughs> shittier song. Those are the ones I like of hers as like the shitty pop songs. Um, <laughs> but I like, I remember thinking, wow, how did sci fi afford? They really didn't. They were so mad at the like directors because they paid $22,000 for that like five seconds of not even playing her song, but they're all singing her song. (laughs) That's insane. Yeah. Um, Cause right. It really isn't that long, like that scene. So I was like, I wonder how much, because this was when this song was popular, right? Like 2001, like I think I graduated and that was like the song we were playing all the time. Um, And it's not just like 10 seconds where, you know, you can, I think pay like a kind of the the least amount of money. Like it's going on. It's in the background for the entire scene. Like even, when like uh it cuts to like outside the shelter you can still hear it yeah so it's on it's it's playing for like i think like a full minute it's like basically half the song (laughs) yeah i i i had a different impression of why that's in there or, or rather um what that felt to me i was thinking about these scenes with guns neighborhood and his group and all of that versus this is a weird comparison, but the initiative in Buffy season four, Ooh. right? Okay. Um, the 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 reason the initiative sucks for me <laughs> is its total lack of authenticity. Like authenticity is such a weird thing; it's hard to describe, but you know when it's not there. Mm-hmm. And the initiative do not feel like soldiers. They do not feel like any sort of qualified people to be walking around a college campus carrying guns and fighting monsters. It feels like Apocalypse Now dinner theater when it's on screen. It feels <laughs> campy and cheesy and and weird. And Angel, the, but that kind of works on Buffy uh, more because it's, it's more often high camp, um, you know, br- bigger, brighter, funnier, lighter. Angel isn't that. It's uh, super gritty, grounded, um, or at least it wants to be. And so the impression I get of uh, the scenes with Gunn's group is they do feel authentic to a degree. There is a sense, uh, it, it does feel uh, certainly more authentic than the initiative, but the way they accomplish that is by st- Deeping it in familiar cliches. Yes. Mm, be it the language, point. the um specifically the 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 dialogue. And this the yeah. scene where, where Gunn's talking to everyone is loaded with stereotyped cliche, um, you know, bust a cap right. kind of tropes of that time period. So that sort of work from the the point of view of sound, like feeling authentic, but now just don't work from the yeah. standpoint of being heavy on stereotype. Um, and that was how the music landed for me is is um, borrowing authenticity 
uh, lifting flavor and context and all of that that the writers don't personally have access to as a very white writing room yeah mm-hmm. uh, to to paint the background of their scene yeah I mean that is fully correct I I did notice it's like oh they're playing this because it's like what? yeah you yeah know, but I, I mean I just like the song so that's like oh, that's I love the like song that. yeah yeah of course um it's just in that context, it felt so strange. I can I can totally see how you're saying that it's like, you know, some appropriation going on. I also was, I think, the same age as probably those kids when this episode came out. So it kind of brought me back to a place of nostalgia for sure. Yeah. 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 Just in general, because I graduated high school in 2001. So that's like, right. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, think, I feel like this was the song that year, Angela. I feel yeah. Like, yeah. It really, yeah. really was. Oh, it was everywhere. That, that you know, forever, forever, ever. Like it's just, yeah. it's, it's burned <laughs> into our brains. Like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, mm, where do we go? So we are still in the cold open. Um, <laughs> oh God, I'm so are. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically, yeah, after um, Anne closes the door and cuts off the rest of the outcast song, um, we get the reveal that it's somebody in a police uniform, although it's, it's very shadowy. So I don't know how much of that we're meant to see, right. but um, it's giving like this whole episode is giving Terminator 2. Um, yeah. it is. and i think yeah I, I like that the hint at first is that it's this maybe just like one rogue cop or like yeah. a, a, a demon who's dressed as a cop and then obviously we get the reveal later on that it's um it's much much more than that um but yeah so we after the credits um we i mean my notes for this are all over the place but there is a scene with merle who i just feel really sorry for because angel will not leave the poor man alone um <laughs> It's again. It, it's a very in a very busy episode. I don't think that we need um, an appearance from Merle. Yeah. Um. Because all he really does is just like remind Angel that he should feel shitty about how he treated his friends, and he's yeah. right to say it. Yeah. He just kind of like reminds Angel that he's a dickhead, and that's it. I actually <laughs> love that. I love a monster reminding someone that they're a dickhead. Like I thought that was great, actually. <laughs> <laughs> like it's I, it's a fun re- like um recurring character, and I do like it when we kind of we're reminded of the wider world of this show, and it's why I love when they bring Anne back. But yeah, Mel Mel is a it's a fun um a fun actor. It's a fun performance. Yeah, you know, and he's he's one of those weird side characters that it feels like we were gonna do more with him and then they just kill him at the beginning of season three. Um, but because I thought Merle was already dead when we got to him, I was like, Oh, he didn't die yet. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so whatever, he gives Angel some info. We see, um, Anne's talking to the, also the fact that she calls them kids and like, Anne herself would probably be like 19 or 20 here. Right. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think, like, Anne and Cordelia would be the same age, so, like, right. 19, 20. Yeah. And, and I'm like, they I, I feel look the like, same age. <laughs> I, I feel like she's also, like, the, the, yeah, the same age as the people in the shelter. Like, those, they all look like 25-year-olds playing teenagers. Yes. Yeah, that's right. what I mean. Like, I, everyone's like, oh, the kids. I'm like, everyone here looks the same age. What are we talking about? Who's a kid? <laughs> um, but I do like that she says she has someone she can talk to, and it's gun and i i like the this string of episodes i don't know that well like angel i don't know as well as buffy and i think i in my i like rem- misremembered it that like this is when her relationship with gun starts and that's why she's in the finale but i actually and normally i wouldn't like this but i like that it's like yeah they already know each other like that's they were friends you know both of them were trying to help you know like these like younger kids on the street and like that were homeless and i just I don't know. I like that. It's like, yeah, we both did the unexciting work together and we're also friends. And it, and it tracks, you know, they're, they're both teenagers who have, you know, uh, had experience with vampires. You know, she was homeless. He was living um, with his sister and, and, and their community in this sort of like, I, I think it was like a warehouse or something when we first met him. So. Yeah. Um, like they have, I mean, not similar, but kind of overlapping backgrounds. And so it's, it's not a huge, like it doesn't, require a huge leap in uh belief for the audience to be like yeah no oh they know each other yeah Yeah. that makes sense they've both lived in no she's lived in la for a few years he's lived her his entire life they're yeah like sure and it's and it's a a great like shortcut just to get straight into the episode 
Yes, um, yes. And another thing that I really like, um, actually, is, you know, yes, the, the writing and the acting of, of these, you know, uh, street kids is is quite hackneyed. But I do enjoy that the episode doesn't waste our time by having Gunn or anyone else, like, not believe them when they say that the cops are harassing them. Yeah, I'm glad that it's, like, just one second where he asks, and then he's like, okay, like, he buys it, and we're good. We yeah. keep moving. I like that. Um, yeah. But so he goes, I also, it's so wild that she meets Cordelia for the first time in this episode. Like I, once I thought about it, I was like, oh, right. Every time Buffy met her, it was like, not with the Scoobies. So that does make sense. But I, I like that. It's like Cordelia and Wes and her are all meeting for the first time. And it's like, oh, they were all in Buffy season three. Um, which and I like that it's never like, she never reveals to them that she's met the Slayer or that yes. she spent time in Sunnydale. Like it's, that's just fun audience, um, like fun information for the audience to have. Yes. Cause it gives us additional understanding, but like the other characters, you know what? It's like, this is not Buffy's show. We don't need to mention her all the time. Mm-hmm. Like let's yeah. just, it's just like, it's good um, background that we know about her. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I like that too, because it's like, you know, it's the, it's the world building we like about Buffy, right? It's like, oh yeah, we know that they were all in Sunnydale at the same time or, well, they weren't, but they all were like in Buffy season three at the same time. And like, I don't know. I just, I like knowing that, but they don't have to say, remember I met Buffy. Oh, you know, Buffy. Like we don't need to do that because they wouldn't do that. Right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to do a Ryan Houlihan here and bring up Charmed because uh, <laughs> I know this is that something that he loves to do every week. They, they, they love to do every week. Um, like a Charmed episode would be like, oh my God, remember two and a half years ago in season three? I mean, when we were like, when we were doing this uh, and they would like, they would absolutely like spell out who this character was and, and where we know them from. Yes. Yeah, that's, you know, I did my first, like, I try not to be, like, shitty about other shows, but, like, some big account had tweeted, like, only one of these shows is good, and they were hinting that Charmed was better than Buffy, and it was, like, pictures of Charmed and Buffy, and I was, like, so I quote tweeted it with, like, one basically invented pop culture, the other is Charmed. Uh, well, and Charmed references Buffy, and Buffy never references Charmed, yeah, so. Which, mm, Ooh, um, but like, you know what I mean? I don't even I don't even hate Charmed that much. It's like just stupid. It's like stupid fun, whatever. You know what? My TikTok for you page is literally it's like the Sylvanian drama account, and then it's just um, old clips of Charmed, but the <laughs> Shannon Doherty seasons because they were the best. Yeah. And every single time one comes up, I'm like, I'm watch- I'm watching this all. The way through i'm watching the truth spell episode in like a series of 20 second clips <laughs> um but like it was funny because everyone was like kind of like getting a kick out of it and then oh boy the people that were like mad you would have thought i said like you know charmed murdered someone's mother like i was just like all right like fucking relax I, it's fine i love that there is charmed hive in 2023 <laughs> right <laughs> that's hilarious um, but okay so we then well, God, where the hell are we, Philip? <laughs> um, okay, so um, Anne comes to the team for help. Uh, Gunn accompanies her to the shelter. He uh, talks to the teens, finds out they're being harassed. And I mean, we're speeding through this, but ba- then basically, um, oh, Angel, an angel has been following them. Right. And then Angel gets um, attacked by a police officer. A fight ensues. And then Angel kicks the guy's head off. <laughs> oh my god, that was so alarming! I totally forgot. Like, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I was like, let's, oh, wow. <laughs> let's let's be clear. He doesn't just kick the guy's head off. He backspin kicks the guy's head off. <laughs> and it's like Angel. If you thought this man was a living, breathing human being, he would still yeah. be dead. <laughs> that is a whole. That's a whole motif in both Buffy and Angel. The whoa. Thank God that one was evil yeah. because if not, I just murdered a person. <laughs> uh, the other, the one that immediately comes to mind is when uh, Buffy beats Ted to death and he uh, knocks yeah. him downstairs. I was like, oh, thank God he was a robot because otherwise, otherwise <laughs> she murdered a human being. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are there are several of those throughout yeah. the show. Yeah, I did always think like it would have been kind of like cool to be like, oh, we did it. Like they do it with faith, but that's like we never get like Buffy or Angel like, ooh, they did go a little too far and oops. Well, that that's kind of an issue with this arc. The whole that's supposed it, it that's already supposed to have happened. Right. <laughs> Angel closed the door and locked 
a a uh, bunch of human beings in a room with two vampires who uh, all then all got murdered. That and and the episode where that occurs writes that the text is that that is evil, reprehensible, and he is in trouble. And then he fires the team, and then we don't talk about it again. The only person that hold takes Angel to task for that, for some reason, is Kate. Kate, Kate is the one who says, I'm done helping you. I can't believe you did this. But the next episode in redefinition where uh, the team is walking out the door after they've just heard that their boss was complicit in the murders of 20 human beings. All they talk about is how upset they are having gotten fired and how their fifis are hurting. <laughs> Not the moral outrage over what happened. Well, and we, I don't know. I don't know that I'd be that morally outraged. I, these, I, are, these are superheroes. I get what you're saying, though. Yeah, Murder okay. is wrong. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, they, but they were lawyers no murder is wrong <laughs> um but so yeah the, the the kicking his head off is like so ridiculous <laughs> i lo- yeah i love it <laughs> I, I really had a moment where i was like when that happened i was like holy shit like i does does angel go deeper did i forget like like is, does is he about to have killed a human and he's gonna go through an experience like i could not and then i saw the head and i was like oh, okay because i was like wow it was really graphic like <laughs> like up until it started shriveling i was like what am i watching <laughs> It just and it's like shot so weird and like you said ian it's like the weird spin kick but <laughs> Sure, whatever. Um, and I, I almost wish we had gotten a little bit more of that. Like, I feel like that would have upped the episode if there was more like, ooh, they're attacking. Like I said, like, rip an arm off. Show me, like, them getting cut in half and still crawling towards them. But also budget, I'm sure. Um, they spent it all on Miss Jackson. Oh, Miss Jackson, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it. <laughs> so Gunn's old, like, gang shows up. Also, every time I say old gang, I feel like I'm saying, because there's a name, but that's the name of the episode where they last show up is old gang of mine. Um they show up and it's very weird that this is like the like set face of his gang until that last episode of them, because these aren't any of the people that were in his first episode where he actually met his gang. Um, and this is a plot point that always kind of annoyed me with gun. They never really knew what to do with him. I feel. Um, and like, I don't like, we haven't talked about his, like he hasn't seen these people in a year at this point. And they kind of reason it out when like the plot calls for it. And that like is annoying. Cause it's like, wouldn't he still work with those people? Like he was the head of that, that group. Like there's, like, like, there's a little bit of dialogue where they sort of, they do allude to the fact that, you know, Oh, um, you know, we, we, we thought you disappeared. Like you, we never see you around here anymore. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's kind of bucks or whatever. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's, uh, you know, it's really heavily implying that, the more he works with um, Angel and the team, it's been to the detriment of, of of the other people in his life. But I think also that's the writers maybe just like being, yeah, like, don't worry. Like, we're not going to be spending too much time with these people. Like, Gunn <laughs> really is moving away from that. And yeah. I think the, the season three episode where we see these characters again is the last time. Yep, it is. So it's like this and then uh, one more. And then it's like Gunn is just fully ensconced in, um, in Angel investigations because there is clearly just like uh, either a, a discomfort or uh, just sort of a, an inability to, to write and explore this kind of world. Yeah. So that, you know, that every, every, every time I try it, it just it fe- feels weird and I feel weird watching it. <laughs> <laughs> because again, to go back to what we said before, then Gunn mentions his plan and he's like, I'll be walking while black. And like, I appreciate Gunn like saying the thing, but like they don't quite, I don't know. We don't, we don't ever... And Ian, you said, then they kind of back away from it, right? It's like they kind of... I mean, that's a joke that I have heard in other media. It's, again, uh, borrowing authenticity uh, in that situation. And if the episode... The episode has all of these pieces that are... That could be making social commentary about uh, race and police and all of that, but it just gets undercut uh, in several different places... And, and just ends up not working. The big one that I I don't think was as much a part of the zeitgeist at this time, but is in here, is the understanding that uh, the relationship between crime and poverty, and that you know these things have 
vastly uh, nothing to do with race and everything to do with poverty in this country. And so, uh, but by virtue of the fact that um, the the uh, the history of this country is steeped in racism and uh, the inequity that goes along with it, you know, things have sort of fallen along the way they are. That's not really in this episode, but you do have a homeless shelter. You do have the the rich people in the beginning that look like they're going to be the case of the week. Uh, and, and they end up going and taking care of this other story. So poverty is there by nature of the circumstances, but I don't think that the episode really has anything to say about it from the standpoint of yeah. crime and race, which are also in here. But again, all of the, the, the quote unquote racial commentary to me feels borrowed from other, more substantial material that was devoted to that topic. So, or, or rather at its heart was about that topic. And, and so including it here just feels like a misfire and then we'll get to it. But at the end of the episode, when you start saying there are bad guys on both sides, yeah, you completely yeah. nullify any good that you might have accomplished by including these things in the first place. I completely mm. agree with that. Ian. Yeah. Um, yeah. that I felt like any good that they may have done by mixing in, you know, things that might have made someone think back then was undone with that end kind of I mean, I, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I that's like it bums me out that they like then backtrack. Um but okay, so Angel goes to see Kate. You know, this is she's becoming less annoying. And I forget in Blood Money. Ian, do you remember in Blood Money? Is it like that's like where we start repairing the relationship a little bit with Kate and Angel? Yeah, or with uh, the with team and Angel. and Angel? Or is it this episode where like they start to get more normal with each other? Um, I can't remember now. Yeah. Um, I didn't watch Blood Money before I watched this, but yeah. um, the 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 beats between Angel and Kate and this I think are kind of nice. Yeah. Um, and it's just too bad that. Kate gets interesting finally um, right before she's off the show. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a line where she even says like, Oh, I haven't seen you in a while. So I think Mm -hmm. this is, um, they're sowing the seeds here of like them coming to a resolution. Um, Yeah. I think the last bit was um, when she lets Angel out of the car in um, the name escapes me and he goes back and locks the lawyers in the wine oh, cellar because she specifically surprise. shows him the crime scene photos in this episode as though they haven't seen each other since that happened. Ooh. So uh, I don't think that happened in blood money. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, you know, he tells her he killed a cop but he shows her the badge. We find out that she went to his funeral six months later. She also recaps everything Darla and Drusilla did because they're looking into it. And then we see, Cordy is trying to convince Gunn not to do his plan on the phone. She makes the joke to Wesley, the third eye isn't going anywhere, and they decide to go help Gunn. That third eye is not going anywhere and will be a problem. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> cut to the, we cut to the graveyard, and I actually, this is like, again, one of the times when like I'm like, yes, this makes sense for her to be talking about her dad and thinking about her dad, because they, you know, I do like when Angel's like, oh, the soil's been moved, and she's like, how can you tell? And he just like looks at her and she's like, oh. love that unspoken beat. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. I, I love vampire. <laughs> yeah. I love, I mean, to reference the other thing I reference a lot in like that, it reminded me of um, the end of the newest scream, which I felt mixed feelings about, but I love there's an end beat when like the killer's there, the killer's been stabbed. And our final girl says, Sam Carpenter says to her sister, Jenna Ortega, you know, I'm not going to murder him. I'm not like him. And Jenna Ortega just like tilts her head and is like, come on. She doesn't say anything, and then she kills the killer. Like, that's a thing that I like when it's like an unspoken beat. Because again, like you said, Philip, Charm would have needed them to say, oh, this is why you know. Let me explain. Like, (laughs) um, we cut to the shelter, and oh, well, we get Kate. She runs over dad's grave. She cries. She wants to know who's doing this. We cut to the shelter. Wes and Cordy are there. Um, We're kind of setting up for the end, right? All All the, like... Pieces are moving into place for the like the creepy, creepy drug dealer. Yeah, yes. what's his deal? Right? Is it Jackson? Is that his name? Yes. He trying to um, sleep with the teenage girls when he walks in. He's like, I'm gonna find a bed real quick. Like yeah. it's like it was Ooh. unnecessary. <laughs> like, 
That is such a, a major part of the early Angel seasons. It reminds me of um, the torture vampire from In the Dark. Oh, why? Yeah. Why does he have to be a pedophile? He's right. already a torturer. Like right. <laughs> in, in ten seconds, you establish him as a rape, a murdering rapist. Like <laughs> it, right. it, it's such it an early two thousands thing. It's like um, in Blood Money. You know, there's a real undercurrent of the risk of sexual violence against Lila. It's like it's just a well that I think shows of this era went to as a really. Yeah. lazy and easy way to show like oh this dude's like yeah. this dude's not on the level you know like oh yeah. he's 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 being incredibly sleazy and the fact that like these two young women are saying like no we don't want you to come in and he just like physically forces his way past them it's like oh this this guy's no good yeah and we see that the the weird beat that i had to look up when cordelia's like hey that's my shirt oh i i thought i had one just like it and it's that Angel had given a bunch of their clothes at a shelter, which is... Which is fucking rude. <laughs> 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 Becomes a great beat later, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, the creepy drug dealer is there. They're, they're, they're kind of locking all the doors and, like, buckling in for the night. Um, and then we've got Gunn and his friends out on the street. And the camcorder stuff, even though it doesn't really end up going anywhere plot-wise is so eerily prescient yeah. um, given, you know, everything that has, uh, has happened, you know, sort of post 2020. Um, it, well, was, yeah, it, they, was like, it was a real shiver of a moment for me. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, definitely doing, um, I, I think referencing Rodney King in that, but then the fact now that everyone has a camera in their pocket mm. uh, it means, yeah, it, 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 it sort of echoes in both directions. Yeah. Um, in the story, but Jackson, the thing that bugs me is that the story didn't need a well. There are bad guys on both sides. Yeah. Uh, model. No. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's the only reason this character exists in the story, is so that we can eventually have gun monologue to him and saying, "Look at you, a thug with a gun, perpetuating the cycle." And J. August Richards does a wonderful job of delivering that. But holy hell, when you think about the yeah. all white writers room writing that line mm-hmm. and then having Jay August deliver it, it is so it's thuds so hard. Uh, yeah. It is so tone deaf. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, he, he, yeah. He, he not only from the, you know, evil at 11 ness of the character, but <laughs> from the fact that the only reason that he's in this story is to allow them to play to the suburbs so to speak it, yeah. it really defangs the episode that they don't have the 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 courage of the convictions to say yes police brutality is a problem they're like oh no no like cops cops are doing their best it was that it was just the fact that these were zombie yeah. cops it's yeah. like yeah. oh fuck off you know yeah. and like i i think it would have also landed more if because i don't we don't really know if the whole police force is in on the like zombie cop shit or if it's just the captain and i wish we would have landed on the whole precinct is in on it. And like, while the zombies are invading, maybe some of the like human cops are there too, to like help the zombies um, would have been a like stronger way to land. Oh, that would have been interesting. Right? That would have been really there. great. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so, okay. So we get gun meets the police officer. The police officer's kind of just like, put your hands up, blah, 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 blah. Wesley runs around the corner <laughs> and tells the cop not to shoot. That guns his friend and Wesley gets shot. Um, which I kept thinking of, wow, he's been shot and stabbed a lot. <laughs> like I think this is the first yes. like real injury of his, you know, before he gets like his throat cut and then stabbed to death. Um <laughs> he really goes through it. They yeah. put Wesley through it. <laughs> most of most of Wesley's character development beats occur from v- extreme violence, but the first one is uh, him getting stabbed in the throat with the crucifix. In uh, oh, right. oh, of course, right. yeah, yeah, under the under the skin. Under the skin. Yeah. Which in that moment, the kid is using his voice to talk to Wesley about how he was never good enough for Daddy. 
and though uh, God Wesley's Ark, uh, love it or hate it, is so, uh, so complex and interesting. You think about where that is in season five, um, and that's what eventually pushes Wesley over the line, and the the um, the angel or not the angel, the demon pushes the crucifix into his throat, and it's grisly. And the way that foreshadows later beats in his story is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, he gets shot, Gunn and Randall and George, who Randall is the face of the gang moving forward. George, we also see again. They both show up in uh, the episode before the final arc. They like run away with Wes. They kind of they call an ambulance. There's something where the ambulance won't come to where they are. They have to go meet the ambulance. And we see Angel and Kate going to the precinct that's in charge of this area. That cop is kind of just like, eat an apple, like, mm, crime's really down, blah, blah, blah. He says they used to be scared to come into work, which, like, again, is like, ooh, we're almost getting to, like, them being flat-out racist, but we don't, I don't know, we don't, because then in the end, Kate's like, oh, murders and rapes were down, and it's like... <laughs> yeah, I hated the end. I yes. was like, I was riding for it up until the end, because <laughs> I really didn't, re- I think the last time I saw this episode was probably in 2001. So, so I was like, "Oh shit! Wow, look at the!" And then at the end, I was like, "Oh, I take it all back. Take it all back." (laughs) Um. So we then they're in the ambulance. The ambulance gets blocked off. The one EMT goes out to be like, "Oh, you guys gotta let us." Gun realizes what's happening a little too late. The EMT gets shot to death. Gun jumps in the driver's seat. They're driving. I don't quite know why they go to the shelter. Because, right, then they get in the shelter and the EMT is like, we have to take him to a hospital. And it's like, well, we were in an ambulance. <laughs> Why didn't we keep going to the hospital, right? Well, the plot required them to all be in the same place, Ian. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> um, I mean, I have to say, like, the the first time I watched this, um, like, that gunshot, it's a real shocker. Yeah. Um, and it does immediately up the stakes. Like, there is a ticking clock now where, like, Wesley mm-hmm. requires medical attention. There is a shot towards the end when he's on the sofa in the shelter where he looks dead. Yes. Like, he yes. is staring into space. He is the color of, like, ashes. <laughs> <laughs> they really make it seem like, oh, my God, is Wesley going to die? <laughs> And it's like, yeah, we, we've got the, the existential threat, which is the zombies, but we also have this, like, incredibly uh, immediate, uh, you know, uh, problem as well, where, like, Wesley needs to be taken to a hospital. And and I, I, I like that it just, like, it it's a very busy episode, but it's just, like, it lends us, like, stakes that we can kind of reckon with, whereas, mm-hmm. like, zombies breaking in, you know that's going to get resolved. Right, yeah. But, yeah, it's just, like, it made everything more immediate. So yeah, so they're they're all in the shelter. Uh, the cops are converging on them, uh, and then yeah, they 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 just start like climbing the walls of the building, <laughs> taking off the gates from the windows, and doing all sorts. They were doing the most. Those zombies, they, they were, and they were barricading every like window and door. I like, I don't know. I just like this. This is shit. I like where it's like very like whatever horror movie action. And we then see what angels talking to the captain of that precinct. Right. And he wanted to, and he's like, I want to talk to you about some more of your dead cops. The captain laughs, shoots him, angel vamps out and like kicks his ass. And I do like intercutting this with what's going on at the shelter. Like we see gun and the shittier dude get into a fight and breaks it up. Cordy is like, calling 911 and mad that the circuits are busy, which, like, I don't know why we're calling 911. Um, All the cops are zombies. Right? Like, the cops are zombies. They're there to kill you. (laughs) Don't Don't call more. more. Yeah. You know what? Could you send over more zombies? These ones are mean. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I do like that Anne gets attacked through it's not the window. I think it's a vent that, like, a zombie underneath the window that the zombie hand comes through. I like that Cordy comes over with a fucking hammer and, like, Saves her. Uh, yeah. Yes. Cordelia said, all cops are bastards. <laughs> yeah. And she hit that guy with her hammer. Gave this, Cordelia a hammer. I, 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 I just, I enjoyed that. that right? A lot. <laughs> I, this is where I wish it could have been able to be bloody because it would have been cool, like very zombie movie. If like, you know, Cordy's smashing the hammer and like blood's like getting sprayed on her and Anne and like, they look all badass. Um, but that is the horror movie lover in me. Um, 
Philip, do you... <laughs> I... <laughs> so then, um, so yeah, basically you're like, okay, Angel, hurry up. Uh, and it, <laughs> we just have this very like perfunctory scene where Angel um, basically like chases the captain into like this secret room behind his office <laughs> where he's got all of the, the pictures of the dead officers and... So, some a very coach. well curated like shrine. I oh, loved it's it actually. Very <laughs> aesthetic, yes. Yeah. That's um, where the authenticity <laughs> of the episode went. And uh, turns out, yeah, there's there's some generic zombie god, um, and like all Angel needs to do is is smash the idol uh, to break the spell. Um, but you know, has has to like we, you know, tussles with the captain for a, a minute, bef- right. so, just so we get like maximum peril in uh, in the shelter. <laughs> Yes. And then he breaks the idol over the captain's head, uh, and the zombies all just go to sleep. <laughs> just go to sleep. Yes, they just, they just lie down. They're done. <laughs> <laughs> it's the like guy, a... did they have to move all those bodies? Right? Like that's the next thing that every I was thinking that too. <laughs> like, how do they explain the the cop corpses in their shelter? It's numerous, yeah. <laughs> Remind me, I might be wrong, but in Dead Man's Party and Buffy, they just like disappear, don't they? Uh, I think so, yeah. I yeah. think like yeah, I think it's like they just disappear. And like while that is plot devicey, that makes more sense because it's like, really, how would they explain all these bodies? Right. <laughs> um and like I do like all of it, but it is anticlimactic. I wish there had been it almost feels like they like ran out of zombie budget because I like I wanted more zombie horrorness to all this. It feels like it's building to something, um, and then just before, like a, a, a final like showdown or battle or something, it's like, oh, and and we're done. Yeah, because in my brain, remembering this episode, because again, I think it hasn't been as long as you, Angela, but I I think like last time I rewatched this was when my like ex boyfriend was going through Angel with me. Um, and I thought that this, for me, this was like half the episode was them like slip sliding around the shelter, getting away from zombies, but it is not. It is five, eight minutes maybe. But so also, oh wait, also the the shitty drug dealer guy says time to go to work. Isn't that what Angel says in the finale? Yep. Okay. I thought that was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> I thought like I thought that was funny too, and I I guess I forgot that Angel said it when I was watching <laughs> that because um, I I rewatched it this morning, and when I was watching it, I was like, I guess he's going back to hit the streets. I guess <laughs> <laughs> like what time to go to work? All right, go sell your drugs, dude, creeper. Yeah. Get out of the high school shelter, <laughs> like yeah, <laughs> it was um, so weird. Yeah, it's so weird. Um. So then we we get like whatever we get that wrap up. They bring Wes to a hospital, and then we're like on Kate and Angel and this. I mean, like you said, Angel. This is where I was like, oh come on. She's like, well, you just gave back a lot of murders and rapes to that county, and it's like, fuck you. Like, yeah, that was unnecessary. That right, was because- that was that they could keep playing in in Middle America. I guess. But. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're like, I got to make them happy with saying that. <laughs> 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 because like those zombies were literally murdering people and it's like uh. well and the weird part too is that it undercut because there's a parallel between this uh story and angel's character exploration and what he did it undercuts yeah the whole point uh that what angel did was wrong yeah <laughs> you know l- <laughs> right. like it sabotages any development that occurred uh in terms of angel's examination the one nice bit that's in that scene is uh, she reads off the statistics and she says, that's what I, I would give back to the, or that's what we gave back to that neighborhood. And Angel says, I'll take it over. I mean, meaning yeah. I'll take it over what the, well, the alternative yeah. is. So there is a little bit of that, but also you just now have that dissonance of, yeah, but they were evil. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it, it's so, Wants to have its cake and eat it too. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And then we get, which I really, I really like. I, I like all of this. This, this ending after this one, I like when she's like handed a file and she's like, "Isn't this the guy that works for you?" And Angel finds out Wesley got shot. And someone, and I'm yeah, whoever is is gonna want to kill me. I forget who in our Patreon Discord said they shipped Gun and Wesley. And I was like, Oh my, oh my god. god. 
I didn't Wesley see it. Wesley and Gunn one. in season right. two are such a couple. And <laughs> yes. this scene of Wesley waking up, it plays like they are lovers. Yes. There are so and- many moments in season two where Wesley just looks at Gunn with these big eyes. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, they they love each other so much. And I, I, I really like that it's played as like a really nice friendship before yes. Fred gets in the middle of them next season. <laughs> um, like it, it's like, you know, we, we get... Um, a whole episode of Cordelia and Gunn as like the odd couple in first impressions. But I actually really love the kind of the, the understanding that Gunn and Wesley came to and that like this moment of tenderness between them. I love it. Honestly, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I, I don't think I had ever thought about them, but this scene, I was like, Oh wow. This is like a, like the, the way they're looked They're like the eye connection. He's holding his hand. I mean, like, and even like I like Wesley's. Is this morphine? Well, it's bloody good. Like, and then they hold hands and like. But then we get Cordy encounters who uh, Angela. You mean when when the boss shows up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Angel, she says, "Get the fuck out." <laughs> <laughs> I I think she's the perfect. I'm glad that she was the one to have this moment because she deserves this moment, right? Yeah, like. She's known him the longest and she has like, they all have reason to be hurt, but she would probably be the most hurt because she thought this was like a true friend and he fucked them over. And like, while I maybe would have let him visit Wesley, but I like that she's just like, oh, it takes a gunshot for you to give a shit. Well, get out. Like, we do not need you. And He deserves it, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely, one hundred percent. She's she is right to say it. And yes, per usual, Cordelia is right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then he leaves, and I like that. That's there's no like happy wrap up with them, and I like that. I like that we then see the happy wrap up is Cordelia was like whatever, getting coffee or snacks for them, and going into the hospital room, and her gun and Wesley have their like come back together happy moment ending and angel just has to fucking get out and it's bookended by you know the start of the episode he's on his own in the hotel Mm -hmm. and then at the end he's like leaving alone again and we're finally starting to see that being alone is taking a toll on him yeah and i just i like that i like it um which is all leading to reprise and epiphany it all really is like and Ian, I know you love those episodes. They do. It does feel like we're leading to that as a finale, doesn't it? As a season finale. Yeah, Angel. Um, I've heard multiple reasons why everything from Sweeps Week, because it was always trying to find an audience, to uh, network demanded pivots. But Angel always had has split season arcs. Yeah. So about around sixteen, seventeen, eighteen is the first finale, and then there's a new arc, the Jasmine arc. Uh, the oh, Jasmine, she's coming. Jasmine <laughs> yeah. saves that season to me. Um, yeah. Oof. But then now the, you know, reprise and epiphany ends the first bit. We get one or two episodes of just sort of where to now, and then you get the Pylea uh, arc as the back season. It's a really unusual structure for an arc show, but I kind of dig it. Yeah, and I guess... I'm trying, I don't know. I guess I'm just spoiled by Buffy. It just feels like, so I have heard um, Joe Hill, who does a lot of the the faces of the figures you see that I photograph, um, told me that he had heard that both Christian Kane and Julie Benz were unavailable, which you mentioned, Ian. And that's why the Pilea arc ended up happening. Like it was something they had in mind, but they weren't going to use this season. And then those actors, but I, I've been trying to find anything and I can't, but I mean, Christian Kane was not busy then. Um, Julie Benz would have just been starting Dexter, so that makes sense because I'm sure that paid her better than the WWE. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I was like, wonder, and like maybe because Christian Kane just leaves. He doesn't, it's not like, oh, well, we see that character again. We don't see him again until the final season, which definitely doesn't feel like, oh, that was what they planned. That season five always feels like, and I love season five, they try to be like, this was the plan all along, but it very much feels like lost where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what we were always leading to. And it's like, no, you fucking weren't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but okay. So I guess, yeah, we're at the end. Um, favorite scene, Angela. Uh, favorite scene. I think, gosh, I mean, <laughs> they were all very interesting. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with Cordy telling him to get out. 
All right, I'm gonna take that one. <laughs> I, say, I say, Cordy really stood in her power in that moment, and I liked it. All right, all right, uh, Philip. Uh, yeah, it, I loved the, the Cordelia moment at the end um, because I just, yeah, she's the only one who really ever has the right to tell Angel off. Yeah, um, but I'm gonna go with the moment that came just before it. Uh, Wesley waking up. A lovely tender moment with Gunn, and then that that great little uh, undercut of like, oh, is this morphine? It's bloody lovely. <laughs> um, just yeah, a really nice moment um, of like human connection in a kind of episode that was all over the place. Fair, fair. Ian. Yeah, I'll go with Gasly. Okay, Gasly. <laughs> That's a good ship name. Um, yeah. That's a great one. <laughs> I was thinking like one, but I like Gasly better. Yeah, I like Gasly. <laughs> um i for me it is a tie between the whole like zombie invasion of the shelter and then the end beat with cordy because i just fucking love that um favorite outfit uh this one is kind of a little bit difficult but philip i think it's gonna have to be the 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 kind of burgundy leather blousey thing that cordelia is wearing with that like triangle necklace (laughs) it's just well it's the only good outfit in the episode like i can't remember what (laughs) Like Anne is just wearing hoodies. Yeah, you know Wesley and Gunn's clothes just never change. Angel's <laughs> wearing like a long dark coat. Yeah, I actually I quite like Kate's jacket, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Cordelia. Okay. Angela, are you the same answer? I am, but I also yeah. felt like Cordy's outfit was very like Faith Buffy. Like yes. it felt. Ooh, yeah. It felt that way to me, not just that I liked it because it was cute and it was the outfit of the episode, but also like it kind of felt like a nod as well. Mm. Okay, I could see that. A fashion nod, if you will. (laughs) Um, Ian? Well, I'm having a weird moment. I'm looking at the thumbnail for uh, Thin Deadline and it's Wesley uh, in his hospital gown. And for some reason, I can't help but picture his bare butt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm gonna go with I'll go with the hospital gown. <laughs> um, so I also have the Cordy's like br- I don't like that top. I think it looks ridiculous, but it stands out, so it wins. <laughs> and it's it ends up in the credits. Um, I think it's like season three. Uh, oh, when it? they find when they finally like update the credits and she's got the short hair, uh, there's a little clip. I, I always think of like the clip of her like sitting at the desk um, and she's like looking up. Also, like the hair is finally starting to make sense. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Because that the like black that ha- looked like it has a weird bump it on the top was like not it. But this, I do think this version of that short hair is the cutest. Like yeah, it's like it's like it doesn't look like a wig anymore. Um, yeah. It's like it's it's a cute length. She's like the highlights are a bit chunky, but it was two thousand one. Yeah, um, and, and then Gail like, Sydney from Scream Two. Very that, and you know, yeah, this, this is basically a version of the hair that she's going to have for the next like couple of seasons. So it's like okay, she's she's found the look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Are they. Um, uh, Cordy's often the the one that we hide. She's sort of the the outfit highlight of the show a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I think the costume designer tracks her arc is by de glamming her during the series as the the visions start to take more and more of a toll. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and her commitment to, you know, it's sort of representative of the suffering that she's uh, doing, doing by choice to, to sort of track her arc until her, Send off episode in season five. Yeah, you're welcome. Which to me is the only one. One thing I'm, I struggle with in that episode is I, I'm just going to say it. I, I struggle with a boob window. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, it's it's a little distract. I'm sorry. What are we talking? What what is the emotional, sad, crying moment that is occurring in this scene right here? I don't remember. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, I I do I think that looks I think she looks the hottest she's ever looked in that outfit. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the, the 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 making that an emotional send send off for me uh, <laughs> has always been we'll say strange. But now that I think about the way her um, costumes track her character arc and sort of that being her send off yeah, yeah. episode, it makes a lot more sense to me to sort of. 
glam her up again. You glam her up, because yeah. that's yeah. that was that that's always been a part of her identity, and sort of her returning to heavenly or pristine or getting this second shot or or having this mission. The idealized Cordy, like uh, that. Yeah. Outfit now makes more sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Angela and Philip, I know you'll both agree with me. I feel like if I, me as a person, if I'm like, this is the last time I'm seeing this like X that I have like weird feelings about, I'm going to look the fucking hottest I could possibly look. <laughs> oh, like 100%. And, it, and it's a great callback to, you know, I mean, well, we won't get too much into spoilers, but there is like a plot reason why she looks the hottest she's right, ever looked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, Ian, um, I, I've noticed. I saw you did a massive rewatch of Angel um, last year when we started uh, covering it for the podcast, and I noticed that uh, sort of uh, progression of her outfits as well. I think season three it's the most noticeable because she just goes full business casual. She is wearing these grey blazers. It's just like sensible, like yeah. t-shirts and jeans. It's very. Um, like very very simplified. All right, so Angela mm. does need to go, so we got to wrap this up. What grade do we give this episode, Angela? Uh, B. Philip. Uh, B minus. Ian. C minus. I give okay. it C. I like it, but I give it a C, a C plus slash B minus. Um, okay. But okay, so uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, thank you all for listening. I appreciate everyone still listening when I have been in uh, MIA for a few episodes. Uh, been having a rough summer. This is probably not coming out anywhere close to the summer, but whatever. Um, and uh, I've been appreciating having people fill in for me. Um, and I love that this podcast can go on even when I need to take a break. Appreciated. And uh, if you like Slayer Fest 98, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can support us on Patreon. If you want to follow us, we are at SlayerFestX98 on all social media platforms. If you want to follow me, I'm at Ian Carlos. Philip, where can everyone find you and get your books? Uh, you can find me on Twitter slash X uh, for now. I, I, I will probably be leaving soon uh, at Philip underscore Ellis. <laughs> I'm on Instagram at Philip Ellis. And you can find my debut novel, Love and Other Scams, wherever you buy books. And Angela, where can everyone find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Angela MFN Rockstar. You can find me on X for however long I remain there. <laughs> at, uh, Mrs. Underscore a Rockstar. And I am also on TikTok at Angela Rockstar. And Ian, where can everyone find you and your channel? Still YouTube.com slash Passion of the Nerd. And, um, for anyone who has followed the channel, no, I'm not dead. And there will be more stuff soon. <laughs> all right. Well, we will see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.